Next on Garden Line, a splitting iris demonstration. The rhizome itself should be just right at ground level. A clothing only repellent. And will stand up to several washings. And visiting the sensory garden at McCrory Gardens in Brookings. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Rick Abrahamson. Tonight on our show, we'll visit with an extension horticulturalist who will explain how to divide and replant irises. Also, SDSU's training coordinator for pesticide certification will demonstrate how to properly apply the mosquito repellent permethrin. And during our Garden of the Week feature, Garden Line visits the Sensory Garden at McCrory Gardens in Brookings, South Dakota. The Sensory Garden is known to activate all five senses with its fragrant and eye-catching ornamental plantings. And as always, our plan panel of lawn and garden experts will answer your questions, so get ready to call in. Our panelists are here with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden concerns. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions are John Keekeffer, of Brookings County Extension Educator. Hi, Rick. Hello, John. Chris Zidorovsov. A Minnehaha County Extension Horticulture Educator. Good Chris, evening. Chris, good evening. Larry Osborne, Extension Plant Pathologist. Good to be here, Rick. Larry. And Mike McNig, Extension Weed Specialist. Good evening, Rick. The phone number for you to call with your lawn and garden questions <coughs> is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Helping answer the phones tonight are the Brookings Master Gardeners. And remember when calling in your question, please provide our phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your gardening problem. Be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it is affecting any other surrounding plants, and the moisture and, and or soil conditions that exist. Now, before we get to your questions, we have some important and timely information for you. Since we are nearing the peak of the mosquito season, Garden Line went on location with Extension Pesticide Application Training Coordinator Jim Wilson. Jim will explain the proper method to apply permethrin, an insect repellent that's applied to clothing and helps protect against mosquito bites and West Nile virus. I'm Jim Wilson, Extension Pesticide uh, Education Coordinator at South Dakota State University. When you find yourself in those situations where mosquito populations are extremely high and you find you need to work in those areas anyway, we do have some other options other than strictly insect repellents. Uh, just the other night as I was working through my bees and pe peas and beans trying to uh, move that foliage, mosquitoes were just boiling out. Uh, for those situations, we do have an option uh, to consider that is a permethrin product that is for use on clothing. And uh, make sure you read this label closely. Uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to find. Look in the camping sections, perhaps, of the stores. Uh, clothing and permethrin are what are we, look at, what we are looking for. Uh, this product can be applied to clothing, and as we read the label, it, it indicates, you know, shake the product well, of course. Uh, spray about six to eight inches away from the clothing, taking about 30 seconds to to spray one side of the clothing. And you can see a dampening of, of the clothing. And it looks as though we need to get that just a little bit of a color change, a little damp, in order to get a sufficient amount on. When we complete the one side, we need to flip it over, spray the other side, and then leave at least two hours for this to dry. This is not to be applied to clothing that is, is being worn. It must be applied 
um, again, without being worn. I would button the shirt up to make sure we don't get any more on the inside of the clothing than, than, than necessary. This will last up to about six weeks and will stand up to several washings. About three quarters of a can will do a shirt, pants, and socks. And we might also indicate that not only mosquitoes, but it does help uh, prevent uh, uh, ticks as well. Um, since this is worn on the skin, or worn on the clothing, not on the skin, uh, we certainly do need to uh, use insect repellents on the areas of the skin uh, that are, are not covered by the, by the clothing. Uh, I, found, I found this to be, uh, be a, an excellent product, gives us a little extra protection. It has some repellency, but when a tick or mosquito crawls on the fabric, there's enough, uh, enough uh, ins insecticide there to also provide some control. Well, that was interesting. I'd never uh, heard of using permethrin on your clothing before uh, tonight. How about anybody else here? Sounds it's new to, new to everybody. Yep. Uh, let's go right into our uh, roundtable discussion. John, you have something you want to share with us tonight? Yeah, something just a little bit different again tonight. Um, found these out uh, on some plum trees around here, and these are actually kind of a common insect thing at this time of year. People start noticing them. These are what are called pear slugs. And unlike what the name implies, they're not really slugs at all. And typically what I have people tell me on th things like these are that they've got little slugs feeding on their pear trees, apple trees, plum trees, uh, any number of fruit trees that they'll, they'll live on as larvae like this. And sometimes I've even heard people call them little tadpoles. And they kind of do look just a little bit like a tadpole. When they're exposed to some dirt and things, they get a little bit dirty and they start turning dark. I think we have a photo of a, a darker one here maybe. Um, but they're often a little lighter color as well. And these, uh, these pear slugs like this, like I say, they're not really slugs, they're not tadpoles either. They're actually the larvae of a wasp, a sawfly wasp. Um, and they're something that gets on the leaves, they do some damage to the leaves. Typically, we don't see enough of them to be a real problem, and control is not really much of an issue. But if you do find that you're taking large losses or you just don't even like the look of them on those trees, what you can do is you can go out, and if it's a small tree, you can hand pick these things, just knock them off the tree, or use a higher pressure stream of water, something like from a nozzle on a hose, and just spray that foliage and knock them off. And once they get knocked off those leaves, they're not likely to get back on there. If you want to use an insecticide, these things seem to be kind of kind of wimpy, honestly. Almost any insecticide will kill them. But when we're talking about fruit trees in particular, you want to make sure that the chemicals that you're using are labeled for that sort of use. Well, thank you, John. I think the first time I'd ever uh, seen uh, pear slugs was on a catoniaster uh, many, many years ago, yeah. back when I was uh, working before I, uh, while I was still in college. Anyway, Chris, do you have something you would like to share with us tonight? Yes. Um, we're at a time of year where we want to do anything we can to avoid stressing our lawn. So specifically, we can look at mowing, uh, the mowing techniques that we're going to have in our yard. Um, we want to keep our grass mowed at a height of two and a half to three inches tall. And the other key with that is to not remove more than a third of the blade per cutting. If you look in this picture here, you can see the result of what we call scalping the lawn. When you maybe uh, can't get to mowing your lawn because of the weather, and then you go in and drastically cut it, or you're consistently mowing low, or maybe you just neglect your lawn in general, uh, you'll get this browning across your lawn called scalping. The other key thing with mowing is to keep uh, your blade sharp on your mower. Now, if you're a golf course or something, you need to be sharpening your blade every month. Homeowners, if they can do it twice a year, that'd be ideal. And my guess is a lot of people aren't doing it even once a year. So try at least once a year. Twice a year will do you better. The pictures here, um, look on the right side there especially, is the damage you'll get from a dull mower blade. Uh, picture uh, B, the upper right, you see those uh, vascular tissue hanging out from the blade, that's a sign of a dull mower. And when you get that kind of cutting, you'll have a lot more moisture loss, you'll get browning of the tips, um, you'll have more entrance rooms for wounds for pathogens. Down on the bottom right there, you can see the, the blade number one is a good cut. Blade number two, we're starting to get duller. The blade was bent over. And then when you get over to three, and especially four, it's really stringy there. A dull mower blade will lead to um, an overall dullness across your lawn, a browning or a gray type look across your lawn. 
All right, thank you. Uh, so if I'm not uh, ever sharpening my blade, I'm probably not doing the right thing then, huh? Probably not. Of course, what I didn't tell you is that my landlord uh, mows the grass. So oh, okay. I don't even have a lawnmower. <laughs> uh, Larry, do you have anything for our round table yeah. discussion tonight? You bet. Well, I was good. I'm glad you brought up the pathogen thing, but uh, I'm not going to talk about a plant pathogen tonight. A lot of times we talk about some of the disease concerns. People are just getting tired of hearing about diseases this year. It's wet, 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 uh, one thing after another. I'm going to talk about something a little more interesting to me, at least. Uh, and I'm going to talk about those late summer, maybe f early fall, mushrooms. Doesn't look like much like a mushroom up there, but that's exactly what this is. Now we've had uh, one of our hosts, Tammy uh, Watson, has been asking me about uh, something that she's noticed in her driveway uh, in the wet parts of the year. And what she's seen is right here. This is a jelly fungus. It's really closely related to other mushrooms, but it, it's not what we typically see as those... Uh, white basidiocarps or the, the, the umbrella shape. This is a jelly mushroom that can grow on rotting wood or other organic matter. In this case, it's probably on some old wood chips or something in that, uh, in that driveway. Is it edible? That's a good question, Mike, very good question. That's the, that's the number one uh, concern people always seem to have. They ask me, are these things edible? Well, the, the real answer is, are you going to eat it if I tell you it's edible? <laughs> and in most cases, they're not. They just are curious. Uh, what you see here is a little bit drier version of that. I picked some of that mushroom and took a picture. Now, this is either in the genus Auricularia or perhaps in Tremella. Uh, those are two different uh, fungi that they are pretty closely related and, and jelly-like. Uh, the Auricularia is better known as the wood ear. Uh, it's called that. In the next slide, you'll see why it's called the wood ear. It looks like an ear growing right out of that branch or that wood. Uh, and it's, again, it's it, a true auricularia is edible, but again, identification is the key here. Uh, it doesn't resemble a lot of really toxic fungi. However, we always want to be careful and make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, the uh, Tremella species is uh, a common name is witch's butter. This is brown witch's butter. There's yellow. Uh, other things, other colors. Uh, again, not a real choice mushroom. These don't taste really good. Uh, some Asian cuisine use these for uh, for thickening in soups and things like that. Don't recommend you go try that right away. However, those are not mushrooms that we really have to worry about accidental poisonings of children or small animals and things like that. Uh, again, these are going to be really prevalent this time of year along with those umbrella mushrooms and meadow mushrooms that we see popping up. Now many of those can be very toxic, so best thing to do in your lawn, just pluck them out, throw them in the, in the, in the trash, get rid of those. Uh, make sure that the small animals and the children don't have access to that kind of thing. So uh, on occasion I get questions out in uh, Rapid City area about edible mushrooms. You do you answer those questions? Because I sure don't. Well, I, a, I stay away from it's them. It's a tricky, <laughs> tricky thing. You know, the, the, uh, everybody's got to to uh, to live their own life. Uh, we're not here to give them advice which mushrooms to eat or not eat. Uh, tell them uh, if, if uh, the, the only way to tell for sure is to eat it and uh, find out uh, if you're still here in a few minutes. I guess. Bad way uh, to find ba out. <laughs> bad diagnostic <laughs> test. That's right. Uh, only mushroom experts should really be, and even mushroom experts can have some problems with uh, from time to time. So be very careful with that kind of thing. All right. Thank you. Larry. Mike, uh, do you have something for our round, round table discussion tonight? Sure, yeah. This time of year, a lot of gardeners are just hoping that the weeds will finally end, and most of them do. You know, this time of year, a lot of the weeds are dormant, but there's one that's not really dormant that keeps on going, and that's fringed quickweed or small flower gallon soga. Now, this one isn't really common in South Dakota yet, but it's moving in from the east. I've seen it around here at Brookings, but this weed is absolutely obnoxious because it keeps going, it keeps coming up all summer long. In fact, sometimes it'll go through two life cycles uh, in one season. So if you don't have this, be looking for it and get rid of it quick. Don't let this one go to seed in your garden or it will take over. Is that noxious or obnoxious? This is obnoxious. Oh. It's not a noxious weed. It's not under law to control it, but we ought to, you ought to do it. Now, next photograph here, we identifying characteristics. We'll see some hairs all over the stem. The leaves are opposite on the stem. So be looking for that. Um, next slide here, we've got some other characteristics to be looking for. It gets this real tiny little flower on it, kind of a unique flower uh, with those little uh, white petals on the edge. Uh, there's no missing petals here. That's just kind of how those petals look on this gallon soga. 
And last picture here, I guess, of just of some plants there with those little flowers. So, so be looking, kind of have as a nettle type leaf, be looking for this one. Don't let it go to seed or it will take off. Thank you, Mike. Is is now a good time to control these weeds? Yeah, yeah. I, guess, I mean, and the gallon soga is another good reason why it's good to put on mulch uh, early on to prevent some of those late uh, emerging weeds. So, yeah, there's every day is a good day to control. Every weeds. day is a good day to control <laughs> weeds. Okay. All right. Thank you. Recently, Garden Line visited Macquarie Gardens in Brookings, South Dakota. To stimulate all of our senses, here is a brief glimpse of the sensory garden flora that tantalizes visitors to sniff touch or just look at. Well, it's that time again. It's time to start answering some questions. And we got a question, a couple of questions here from Claremont, South Dakota. I'm going to have uh, see if Chris can answer these. Apple trees are three to four years old. Suckers from the bottom, they keep coming up. Should should they keep them lopped off or leave them? Well, with uh, suckers, especially our fruit trees like apples, you get suckers, and you definitely would want to prune them. But timing is key with that. You want to prune suckers on a tree and water sprouts up in a tree in the summer months, maybe starting in June. And the other thing you want to do is maybe not do them all at once. Prune off a portion of them, come back a few weeks later and prune off the rest of them. Um, if you prune those when you would typically prune a tree during the dormant season in March, you'll end up with more than you started with. So wait until the summertime to prune those suckers out of your tree. Oh, Chris, I got a question regarding suckers. With all the wind coming through, and your, your tree gets knocked off, the top of your tree gets cracked off, you think it's a goner, but you have a sucker coming up from the bottom. Can you just let that go and then get the fruit and then that'll, that'll salvage your tree? Uh, no, not necessarily, because okay. almost all of our apple trees are on rootstock. Okay. So having that sucker come up, you're growing the rootstock of the tree, not the tree. Okay. All right. You, you could have a good, nice uh, crab apple, though, when you get done. Is that what would happen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> also, uh, the same viewer would like to know when is the best time to transplant Russian sage and sedums, uh, dividing and splitting the plants. Okay. Um, for most of our perennials, that springtime is going to be the best time to, to divide them when they're just first act, uh, starting to actively grow. Divide them at that point of the year. Rus Russian sage, though, in particular, doesn't really like to be divided. You can maybe dig down in there and, and pull a few pieces from the plant, but I wouldn't just uh, dig the whole thing up and divide it up. Just take the piece and then replant the piece. 
um, spring. It potentially could get away with uh, late summer into the fall, but, but spring you're going to have better luck with them growing for you and making it through the winter. Thank you, Chris. Here's a, here's a question for Larry from uh, Del Rapids, South Dakota. Circles in lawn. Looks like a ring of fertilizer circle, <laughs> six to eight feet in diameter. Uh, they have not fertilized for two to three years. Uh, um, any idea what might be going on, Larry? Yeah, that's a good sign, uh, a good indication. When they say they haven't fertilized two or three years, that lawn is probably be uh, beginning to get deficient, especially in nitrogen. Uh, that's a, a really good indicator when you start to see patterns emerge in your lawn, especially after all this moisture has leached a lot of the nitrogen down and a lot of that active growth has used it up. A lot of things could be going on. There could be some disease things uh, of concern, but I really am I'm more uh, leaning towards something like a fairy ring. Some source of organic material in that lawn is breaking down, and there's actually a fungus growing through the thatch, uh, and it's releasing nitrogen as it grows, and so the outer edge of those circles is likely the actively growing edge of that fungus, if you will. Could be things like necrotic ring spot or even brown patch, uh, that are not necessarily killing off the turf. You might have a resistant turf. That could be part of that fungus, but it's, it could just be any number of uh, mushroom type fungi, that are the fairy ring type things. Uh, a little fertilizer is gonna even that out. The color, you won't notice it so much, except when that lawn gets really actively growing and you get the height differences. So a little fertilizer, uh, uh, maybe, uh, what do you recommend, two thirds in the spring and a third in the fall or vice versa, something uh, like that? More in the fall than more the spring. More in the fall than the spring, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> come this fall, get uh, start getting some, of you know, two to three, four pounds of nitrogen out there. Uh, well, that's maybe what the turf needs all year long. Is that about right? Uh, if, if you have a lawn that um, you're watering a lot and that you maybe remove the clippings on, the most you'd probably need for the year is four pounds. Okay. If you are not doing a lot of irrigating and you're letting your lawn clippings drop, you probably only need two pounds in a whole year. Well, there you go. So, uh, but get some of that fertilizer on this fall to even that color out and probably do a lot, a lot of good for that lawn. And if you're like Rick, you never fertilize your lawn because it's not his lawn anyway. <laughs> well, something is eating the leaves of broccoli in uh, Hamill, and the holes are about the size of a dime. John, you got any ideas what might be going on there? Yeah, well, of course, with any of these, what we'd really like to see is some sort of pest there. Uh, you know, if you can actually find something that's eating it, that's a better indication as to what you have going on there. Broccoli is one of those cabbage crops. It's in that same family as cabbage. And we don't have a huge number of insects that eat those things because of some of the chemicals in the plants. So the typical ones that we see making holes in broccoli leaves or cabbage leaves or cauliflower leaves, any of those in that family, are going to be a few of the uh, caterpillars, uh, especially the imported cabbage worm, diamondback moth, and cabbage looper would be the ones. All uh, butterfly or moth larvae all caterpillars that we think of. And so what you can do is go out and see if you can find some of those. Some of them are green and blend in pretty well. If you are actually finding those caterpillars on there, then you could put a chemical on to try to control them. And a wide range of chemicals out there that can be applied to those plants and dusts or sprays. And there are even some uh, BT products out there that do a nice job on cabbages. Thank you, John. I'm going to throw this one right back at you again here. This is from Clearfield, which is near winter apparently. Grubs in the lawn. Uh, her husband used a spray two years ago. They don't remember what the spray was. It didn't kill the grubs, but now they have them back worse than ever. Any idea what might have happened there? Right, and this is a, a big one at this time of year as well. Uh, had a number of calls in the last uh, couple weeks about grubs in the lawn, and we deal with a couple different types. Uh, we have the white grubs that get in the lawns, which are the larvae of some of the scarabs. And we get some uh, that look like tiny little white grubs in a way, and those are actually uh, billbug larvae. Uh, different families, control is going to be somewhat similar but a little bit different. And on the white grubs, uh, you know, we actually have a couple different kinds of white grubs. And so one of the things you may want to do is check to make sure that you are dealing with either the annual white grub or the true white grub. Some places in South Dakota we are seeing Japanese beetle come in as well. Um, with the uh, grubs in the, in the turf or in the lawn like that, there are a number of products out there. Um, more often you see granular insecticides applied that way and they're just sprinkled on. They tend to be a little bit longer lasting, a little more effective as a soil application that way than a spray that maybe doesn't get onto the soil because of the lawn itself. 
So if you are looking at those products, uh, you want to look for something that will actually work down into the lawn. And if you're having repeated problems, you may want to look for a cause for that. Maybe you've got lights that are left on and attract adults or something. And, and if you can shut those off, um, not have them on year round, you may have fewer eggs in future years. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to ask for photos seven and eight here. Uh, uh, this one came in via email. She says, I planted this as a bush 12 to 14 years ago. It always got bushy or blushy, I'm sorry, white colored blossoms in the spring. Once in a while there were little hard red berries afterwards. Uh, take a look at the photo and she says she's never seen these before. Uh, Chris, you got any idea what these might be? You know, that sure looks like it's grown into a tree. Um, the one, you know, guess that maybe a plum or something along that line, plum family. I think uh, to identify it for sure though, we would have to have a, a sample in hand. Um, yeah, that looks, sure looks like apricot or plum. Um, and plum would be yeah. fruiting right now or be about that size right now. So um, maybe take it to your local office and then they could uh, mail that fruit in. Uh, would be the best uh, recommendation there so we can get it ID'd for sure. Well, maybe, maybe it's uh, two plants growing together. Maybe it's uh, something with hard red berries and now this plum has come in and kind of taken over. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of funny how some of those things can happen. Uh, this is another email uh, question from Sioux Falls and she says, Hi, Martha Stewart had on her show about a year ago someone who talked about cold frames for winter gardening. Because of health matters, I was told not to eat or, or I was told I need to eat organic. So we now have four garden beds in our backyard, but she can't find any local information about cold frames or winter gardening. Any ideas where she can find some information about winter gardening? Well, you know, specific to South Dakota, I don't know that we have a publication on that, but anything uh, Minnesota is going to have definitely some things on that. If you're talking about just construction, just uh, do an internet search for extension and cold frames and a bunch of designs will come up. Um, as far as specific crops, I don't know that you have to worry so much about what's been tested here in South Dakota. Things that'll do great in cold frames are going to be those lettuces, um, root crop, onions, things like that. You're either trying to start them earlier in the season or go later into the season. Now, typically those kinds of crops would be planted about April 15th outside. Um, so you could definitely, with a cold frame, move it into March. Um, and then within the fall season, you'd be able to extend your season really into November and maybe even December some years with um, those cool season small type of plants. That might not be something where you can grow those plants over the coldest part of the winter in just a cold frame then? It'd be um, a... Some things could potentially make it. Um, I've heard of carrots making it, but then you'll deal with them uh, sending up a flower head the next year. Spinach may be one that might sit there. Uh, but you may have to do some extra insulating to make them last that long. And it is kind of an experiment. Plus, your cold frame may be built a different way than another person's. So really, you need to watch the temperature inside of that thing to know what yours can handle. Thank you, Chris. I think um, the Northern Plains Sustainable Egg Society might be a good resource for her, too. Uh, mm -hmm. They do have a lot of information on organics and uh, are doing some programming this year in the area of high tunnels and stuff, too. So put a little... Uh, little uh, st station ID there or something. Uh, this uh, caller from Meckling has a question about uh, in her yard uh, some wide blade yellow green grass is taking over. What can they do, uh, Mike? Well it's probably, yeah we're seeing those annual grasses come in where the, yeah it's a lighter shade green type grass. It's probably crabgrass, could be foxtail, but it's probably crabgrass if you take a little plant sample and, and look at it real close You'll see hairs all over the leaf, top, bottom, all over the stem. Crabgrass is one of the only grasses that have uh, hairs all over. So if it's an annual grass, what do you do? There are, well, you know, you can, um, you know, you, some people actually do out in a hand pull them. You might have more than you can pull, so that's not a good option. One thing is it's an annual grass, so one thing you might want to do is when it seeds out, maybe keep those clippings in a bag and remove those clippings from the yard so you don't spread those seed. And then after, you know, at the end of the year, you know, it's just an annual grass, so it'll be done at the end of the year. So those are some non-chemical things. Uh, chemical options. There are some chemical herbicides out there you can get at your hardware store. Uh, you know, they're, they're 
plenty uh, available uh, where it'll it'll save for grass and weed control. There's a Weed Be Gone plus crabgrass. Uh, Bear Advance has some products for crabgrass. Uh, the chemical that's active is called quinclorac. Quinclorac. It's kind of a big name, but uh, it's a good chemistry. It has activity on broadleaf weeds as well, um, like uh, creeping jenny, things like that. So it's a, it's a nice mix. Usually it's mixed with broadleaf herbicides, so you'll get your grass and your broadleaf at the same time. The only word of caution, we talked about mulching your garden. If you use the crabgrass herbicides, don't use those clippings to mulch your garden uh, because the herbicide will linger on those clippings and cause some injury to your tomatoes or your potatoes. So don't use the crabgrass herbicides there. But otherwise, uh, they work great. Uh, we're getting a little bit late in the year for them. Once your, once your grass starts heading out, producing seed, the herbicides aren't going to be as effective. So if you're going to spray, you're probably going to want to do that within the next couple weeks if you can. But uh, look at your hardware store for uh, crabgrass type herbicides. Thank you, Mike. A uh, viewer in um, Hartfield, north of Hartfield, has a large garden, uh, vegetable garden, and last night the garden looked fine. Tonight the entire garden ground is covered with rust powder. Any idea what might be going on there, Larry? Well, I'm a little stumped. I mean, there's a couple things that came to mind. Uh, certainly, you know, if you have some sunflowers or beans in there, they certainly could be covered in rust this time of year. Uh, and that would be a dark brown powder, but I don't think that would cover the ground. What I think you're probably seeing or dealing with is something like what we showed earlier, only not the same form of mushroom. You might be dealing with some algae uh, or some lichen or something like that, just uh, moss basically type thing. Things growing on the ground, some plants or fungi growing on the ground that are very fine, they look like powder. Same kind of stuff grows on your, your uh, split rail fence. Uh, or, or your trees on the north side. Uh, so I think you're probably dealing with some orange or some uh, some kind of uh, fungi or algae, something like that, that looks powdery. Uh, that's my guess. I think it's been a little wet for rust uh, disease yeah, this I season, so hasn't it? Especially to, to <laughs> cover the ground like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, up next, we visit the home of Extension Horticulture Specialist, Rhoda Burrows. Rhoda will demonstrate what to do when irises become crowded and the rhizomes need to be divided and replanted in a new location. Good evening. We're going to move some iris tonight, and I'll show you how to uh, dig them out, split them up, and move them to the new location. We have some here that are, have gotten pretty crowded, and, and uh, they're in a location where I don't really want them, so we're going to move them uh, to the new location. A good time to do this is from mid-July to about the end of August. So this is an ideal time to do this. So we just go ahead and shovel right next down to them. All the rhizomes are pretty close to the surface here, so we don't have to go too deep. Cut through. Sometimes you'll have to cut right through with the shovel, but I can see the, the rhizome there and the roots coming out. And this one's breaking apart, but that's fine. This is a good size to move. We'll get, get a couple more here so you can kind of take a look at it. Here's another one. This also gives you a chance to clean out any grass that might have moved into your bed. You can see these are healthy white uh, rhizomes, not any uh, rot on them. When you do this, you want to look at the rhizomes and make sure that they're uh, healthy and any, any parts that are, are uh, starting to turn dark brown or soft, you want to get rid of those. Uh, we'll clean these off and put them in our new bed. Okay, we've got our, our rhizome cleaned off here. Just took a hose to it. And I want to show you this little guy here. He's a little baby that's just getting started. I don't want to take him off separately. I want to keep him connected to the larger rhizome there to feed him. So I'm just going to leave him. And then I'm going to cut back the foliage 
to about two thirds or about eight inches long. And we'll do that on all of them and I'll just leave the little guy. He needs all the help he can get. Okay, and that's ready to stick in the ground then. Now when we plant this, we want them on a slight rise so that they have plenty of drainage. We don't want them setting down too far. And uh, we just barely, we can dig these roots in so they can reach down, but the rhizome itself should be just right at ground level, just barely covered. And there we are. It's happy in its new home, and uh, you don't really want to give it very much fertilizer. They don't take a lot of fertilizer, so uh, this should be ready to go. You know, I remember my first house I had had irises in it and uh, I was just a college student then and they kind of went downhill fast. <laughs> of course, they weren't, weren't in that great a shape when we moved into the house either. But anyway, irises are nice and they, uh, they can be moved and uh, divided relatively easily this time of the year. Here's a question for John from Spearfish. Do cedar trees attract earwigs and how should they get rid of them? Yeah, well this one actually deals with a couple different uh, trees that go kind of by the same common name. We've got the junipers that go by cedar and we've got the, the true cedars that people, or arbor vitae that people see up around houses. Um, really it's not going to be the tree in either case that's attracting the earwig. It's going to be the, the location, the habitat. And those sorts of trees, if they're planted up around houses, tend to provide a lot of shade up close to a foundation. They keep the humidity high in those areas, and earwigs love high humidity in that shady, kind of dark place to hide. If they're really attracted to the place, they're not attracted to the tree in that case. So, uh, you know, if you want to get rid of them, you know, you can use an insecticide around there or obviously thin out that tree a bit or try to remove it even from that site. Thank you, John. Uh, incidentally, that was a friend of mine, and I was supposed to send her flowers, I guess, because she had surgery today. <laughs> She's probably going to get back to me for that one. Chris, is there any truth to black walnut uh, trees near the fruit garden? Is there problems with yield? Any Anything about that? This comes from Sioux Falls. Uh, yeah, black walnut produces a, a toxin called juglone. Um, the roots can have it, the leaves can have it, so if you compost the leaves, you could have this uh, substance in there and uh, when you put it in your gardens it can definitely affect the growth of certain types of plants. Uh, in the vegetable garden your solanacea, your nightshade, your <laughs> tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, they're definitely affected by this. Um, other crops such as a carrot would be less susceptible. Now she's asking fruit and, and uh, I don't know fruit for oh, sure which but there's definitely some that are sensitive. Um, I think raspberries, those kinds of fruits are sensitive to it. Um, but there's definitely lists on the internet. Just just do a search for uh, juglone and uh, gardens and extension, and you'll you'll find a list of plants that can handle that chemical compound. I know tomatoes don't don't do well underneath the uh, black walnuts. Nope. <laughs> um, this is uh, another one sent in via email from uh, uh, Hill City, South Dakota. Attached are two photos, it's photos one and two, uh, of ash trees located on the 1880 trains ground in Hill City. Photos were taken July 20th. They're quite mature, uh, but last, this over the winter, or sometime this spring, they didn't uh, leaf out very well. Anybody want to try to tackle that one? Uh, yeah, I can do that. You know, John did talk about they saw a lot of, a lot of dieback due to that uh, cold snap that hit out in the hills right when the leaves were opening up on the tree. So uh, I would suspect definitely some damage from that. I can tell you these trees are too far gone. They are not going to recover at this point from that kind of damage. Um, other things could be going on as well. Because they're weak and stressed trees, they're probably now being attacked by uh, ash borers, our native ash borers, the clear wing ash borer, for example. So that could also be a problem with these trees. 
Well, I know I've seen a lot of uh, ash trees in the Rapid City area this uh, year with the same thing, and what I've seen is that it's typically either summit or uh, Patmore ash. The other ashes aren't aren't seeming to be that same problem. So it, I think it is a lot of the uh, problem last fall, but also some other stuff too. Anyway, here's another uh, email question from Pier. We have two questions regarding bushes in our front yard. We live in Pier and the bushes are on the east side of the house. Uh, we moved into the house last year and the bushes were here when we moved in. They think the bushes in the boulevard are some sort of evergreen, bush number one here. Uh, any idea what uh, shrub this is from anybody? Uh, that's a Chinese juniper. And they're, they're wondering about uh, digging that that juniper up and they have some gas lines underneath there if that would damage the gas lines if they dug that up and what should they should they what should they replace that with um as far as damaging i mean the the roots of the those junipers are pretty shallow most of them are actually up in the top five inches or so maybe go down to two feet i don't know what the depth of this gas line would be but typically you would just kind of cut it to make it a little bit more manageable and then yank it out with a, a chain maybe a attached to a truck or something along that line um, and as far as a replacement plant, a deciduous type shrub is going to have deeper roots, so that might be more of a problem with your line going through there. You might want to stick to an evergreen of some sort, or just a smaller deciduous shrub that's not going to get so bulky within that space. With those shrubs, though, if you just cut them off at the soil surface, they probably won't grow back, right? Okay. Um, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, you probably have had more experience with those cedars, not, but not a whole lot. But um, they don't really have to remove the roots unless they want to work with the soil. It wouldn't be okay. required. I, I don't know. I'm just yeah, jun junipers. If you cut back to beyond green, they're not going to come much back. Pretty come back. They, so that's a good point. So if they have a gas line, they're worried about digging or rupturing mm -hmm. that gas line. They don't have to remove the roots. Okay. I think. I think if they if they pulled it carefully, mm -hmm. they could probably get it out without any problems on that gas line. If they went in there with the shovel that's when they're going to have mm -hmm. problems uh, hitting a gas line, I think. Nice. Uh, there another photo that they sent is a uh, outside the front of their house and the bushes have small berries on them with a powdery blue color and they're wondering what uh, shrub this is and they'd like to prune them because they're getting as high as the windows. Again another Chinese juniper. Um, the thing about junipers is as they get overgrown, you can't really go back and, and whack them back into shape. You kind of have to do shearing each year annually to keep them in line. Um, it's kind of that story of maybe the plant's too big for the space, and you might want to look at that. But, but just shear a portion of that current year's growth to, uh, to get it to the shape you want, but I wouldn't go too deep into the shrub. Uh, this question comes from Brant. Tomato plants have bumps or knobs on the stem by the bottom of the ground. Uh, then as the stem gets taller, the, the plant must be turning light green, then brown, and then dies. Uh, Larry, uh, what's going on here? <laughs> Sorry, Rick. I, you're going to have to give that to me again. Tomato plants have bumps or knobs oh, on sure. the stems. Well, I think Chris had a good uh, idea on this. Um, right? Those bumps form a lot of times. They're like an adventitious root is what we call it, and they're just sort of aerial roots, and you can pretty much ignore it. So I don't think that's what the plant problem is. Now you said there's also some browning. They, yep, they say that when the stem gets taller, the plant's turning light green, then brown, then dies. Sure. Uh, you're going to be a lot of problems this year with Phytophthora. That, uh, that could be some soil-borne uh, Phytophthora. There's also problems with the late blight, of course, uh, could be on the leaves and the fruit and the upper parts of the stems. And so those, those big brown lesions on leaves and things, that's a good indication you're dealing with something like late blight. Uh, of course, that can come up from the roots as well. There's different phytophthoras. Uh, phytophthora uh, that causes late blight also can affect uh, the stems of those plants as well. And so that could be something like that. Something we're seeing a lot of this year because of the wet soils, and tomatoes are very uh, commonly affected by just edema. Uh, if, if it's humid and the water in the soil is high, there's nowhere for that water to go. It gets into the plant cells. It can't evaporate off. And really what happens is the, the cell just ruptures, and so you see some warts and things like that form on, on lower stems and some leaves. So that's pretty common in tomatoes. So uh, if your plants are dying, I'd be, be more concerned about some of the fungal things. Again, management of late blight once it gets going is pretty difficult. Some of the fungal uh, products, some of the fungicide products can be effective at managing any of the foliar blights, septoria and alternaria and so forth. But again, pretty difficult to control late blight once it's attacked that stem. 
Yes, it is. And we've, we've had some bacterial problems on tomatoes yeah. uh, this, this year, too, out in the Rapid City area, anyway, where they go down pretty quick. Uh, I believe coming from the from the seed potatoes a lot of times too. Bet, is that right? Bet, yeah, bacterial problems uh, in a year like this are going to be all over all the crops. We're having it in, in ag crops as well as hort, um, and so you bet. Uh, of course, the stems we worry about bacterial wilts, cucurbits. Look out this year for your cucurbit beetles spreading around uh, the Orwinia, uh, the bacteria that affects the cucurbits. But potatoes and tomatoes are are pretty susceptible to a couple different common bacteria. Well, thank you, Larry. Well, Mike's over there nodding off, so I think we better <laughs> give him a question. <laughs> this one comes from Pipestone, Minnesota, actually, and uh, something came up in the garden that someone called horse's tail. It is a f five foot bloom wheat colored, what is it, and what is the right name? Yeah, that's pretty close. Uh, horse weed or mare's tail is probably what uh, they may have there. Uh, it's a winter annual weed, so it, it actually starts coming up in the in the fall, and then it continues growth in the spring. So it gets a jump on everything else, and be, can be kind of competitive. Uh, a lot of times, people leave it because it looks kind of like a marigold, or it looks like a flower early on, and they let it grow. And then, about this time of year, right now, it's starting to produce flowers. And then there's a big disappointment because it's just a tiny little. It's a cluster of these little tiny flowers that have little plumes, and then the the seed will go in the wind. It's very, you know. It, it's not an appealing flower at all. So, well, you know, just uh, cut it off and clip it off and pull it, and that's about all you can do. It's a winter annual, so now it's, it's going to be done once it's going to be flowering. But it's going to be shedding seed right about now. They're just starting to open up their flowers right now, so now is a great time to get it out of there to prevent some seed production for next year. All right, thank you, Mike. You, you okay now over there? I'm great. I'm ready to go. going to doze <laughs> off on us here. <laughs> this, uh, this is a surprise one for Larry here. Help me identify this mold, fungus, mushroom, or whatever that grows by the edge of my gravel driveway. Wow. Boy, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a surprise. Uh, if they show the pictures of that again, you'll notice again what we talked about at Roundtable. This is, uh, it's a little hard to tell in that picture. Uh, they're showing some measurements, but really this fungus can get any size, and it can cover uh, acres probably if we have the right conditions. Uh, that that uh, organic material and then proper moisture. Again, this is that auricularia or wood ear. In this case, it's growing on the ground, so we don't think of that those kind of things, but that's probably what it is. It's probably that auricularia uh, and that uh, just again, the wood ear fungus. So I, I got a follow-up question here. Sure. Uh, is this all due to the wet conditions? Sometimes people ask me that, is it due to the wet conditions? <laughs> due to the wet conditions. A lot of times we get more uh, uh, common uh, things during the wet conditions, more, more mushrooms, more uh, things growing in our lawn because there is adequate moisture for those things to get going. Not necessarily. The fungus was there. It's, it's working on that decaying wood. Uh, the fact that there's so much fruiting body, that's probably because of the wet conditions. The fungus was there, you didn't do anything, it's doing its job, it's recycling those nutrients back into the ecosystem. So the, so the wet conditions are promoting the development you of bet. that, but not really causing no, it. No, they're something. certainly not causing it. it the, the fact that there's organic material in that soil, might be wood chips, might be an old log or some roots, could be a lot of things, but that's what's really uh, feeding that fungus, if you will. All righty. All right, we're going to look at another email here that sends some photos. Can you tell me the problem with these red raspberries? Leaves become bleached out while, they are, <coughs> while the veins remain dark. Eventually, a leaf turns brown and curls up. Any idea, Chris or John? Uh, that's definitely iron chlorosis there. You can see uh, the green veins with the yellow foliage there, and then it gets to the point where it'll brown up like that. It happens more commonly in a soil with a high pH. Um, see this in raspberries, see this in uh, river birch, silver maples. Um, a lot of plants can suffer this from this um, problem. Is there anything they can do? Um, you can't just go and apply iron. Um, you have to get it in the right form. Chelated iron can help um, if you put that down, but uh, typically you may have to do this every year. It's, it's, you're going to always have a problem. You've got a high pH soil. Mm -hmm. I, I usually suggest that uh, people try a foliar application as because if they can get the iron in that leaf, it'll green up almost immediately within a few days. They should start to see some changes, although it might be a minute change, but it should get a little bit greener so that that can help to get it green enough so the plant can get a, be a little more healthy. 
John, this question comes from Lead. How long will a grasshopper <laughs> live, and how do they and do they eat cloth? <laughs> oh boy, this is uh, one of those fun ones, and we deal with this a lot with some of the other insects as well. You hear the old stories about mayflies live for a day or fruit flies live for a week. Some of those things are kind of true, but not necessarily, and grasshoppers are one of those that get kind of lumped into this group. The actual life cycle of a lot of these insects takes about a year. We go through really one generation per year. With grasshoppers, we can sometimes see a second generation especially with some species. But for the most part, they'll live for roughly a year. Now, they'll overwinter as eggs. They hatch out in the spring, and they complete their development during that year. So for most of the common species of grasshoppers that we're going to see around here, be roughly the season that they would live. They'll lay eggs again in the fall. As far as whether or not they eat cloth, that depends a little bit on the cloth and really kind of how you want to define eating it. They will chew on any number of things. I've seen them chew on wood siding vinyl siding, I've seen them eat fiberglass screen, if you will, and they're not really eating some of those things, they're just simply chewing on it. In the case of a lot of cloth, what ends up happening with both crickets and grasshoppers, something else gets on that fabric, some sort of food source that they can use, something that attracts them a little bit, and they go and go after that, and while doing that, they end up chewing holes in some of that fabric, or else they just simply land on it and give it a taste and end up chewing some holes through it that way, too. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we've got a few grasshoppers out west, and uh, yeah, they, I right have here. had people call me and say, you know, they ate the paint right off my house last year, so I anticipate they would eat some cloth, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we see that a lot in some of these uh, outbreak years. I think. Here's a question for Chris from Rapid City. When is a good time to dig and transplant lilies? Um, well, with our bulbing crops, you really don't want to disturb them while they're green. Um, Lilies are one that you don't have to transplant, uh, but if you do need to move it for some reason, just wait till the foliage dies down and then move it. Um, we don't want to be cutting it back early. We need those green leaves to stay above ground so that they can photosynthesize and, and develop um, energy to store in the root so that we can have blooms the following year. Thank you. Here's, an, here's a question from Sioux Falls uh, for Larry. Roses are getting powdery mildew. What is the best spray? Oh, the best spray. The best uh, depends spray. on what you mean by best. I think uh, for the average homeowner who's got a lot of, lot of roses and they're in kind of a shady spot, uh, first thing to think about is improving that location if possible. Now, this year that's going to be a really difficult thing to lower the humidity. We're just dealing with with abundant moisture. So, uh, but if you do uh, think you might have a little bit too dense, maybe thin out that uh, garden area a little bit. If you can improve the light by, by trimming some of the trees around that, that's a great thing to do. Light quality is pretty important. Now let's say you've done all that and you still want to control this uh, fungus. Uh, we have a good home remedy right on the Garden Line website if they can get to that. And that involves a tablespoon of vegetable oil uh, some, or, or dish soap. You can use dish soap as well and put that in a gallon of water. Uh, uh, and, excuse me, and a, and a tablespoon of baking soda. A tablespoon of baking soda with it. That's the key ingredient. Uh, the, the dish soap, the oil, just helps that to stick to the plant. The baking soda, what that does is changes the pH of that leaf. The, the, the powdery mildew can't grow anymore. It's really a surface affecting organism. That's the one, and that's a good, or, good uh, treatment. It works really well, but you have to reapply about every week. And your leaves look a little funny for a while. There are plenty of rose sprays that contain a fungicide that work really well on powdery mildew. Just about anything uh, labeled for roses uh, works well to control powdery mildew. Thank you, Larry. Well, Mike, here's a, here's a question from Madison about purslane. It never goes to seed, but it keeps coming and coming. Uh, he pulls it out uh, for over three years, and the purslane won't stop. And sounds like it's driving him crazy. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, that was a close uh, call here tonight, whether to use that as the weed of the week or not. Uh, purslane, is a, as a lot of you gardeners know, battling purslane, it, it, if you don't remove it, uh, it'll regrow again, amazingly. And with all this moisture we've had, uh, keeping that soil surface moist gives it even more ability to reroot and regrow uh, from a pulled plant. So you got to remove the purslane from the garden uh, completely, otherwise it may regrow. And so yeah, you just keep at it. I mean, it's starting to produce seed now, so you want to you know certainly be aggressive, prevent that seed production. Um, you know, no seeds will linger in the soil for a while. So uh, get uh, keep after the purslane, and a good mulch is a good way to help. Uh, eliminate some of those purslane problems. 
you know, Leon Reggie was on a couple of weeks ago and suggested eating some of it. Maybe you develop a taste for it and you decide you want to grow it. Makes a good salad. That's what I hear. Real quick, you got about 10 seconds, Larry. Black-eyed Susan's leaves are turning black and dying. Looks like they're dying. Uh, could be some soil issues there, but uh, if it is a fungus, could be alternaria. Pretty common on, on the sunflower family. All right, and that is all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line replace, repeats twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting's Digital Channel 3, which is also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now, time is to, now it is the time to wrap up. Thanks to our panel experts, John Kiekeffer, Brookings County Extension Educator, Chris Zadorovsov, Minnehaha County Extension Horticulture Educator, Larry Osborne, Extension Plant Pathologist, and Mike McNig, Extension Weed Specialist. I'd like to thank our phone volunteers, the Brookings Master Gardeners, and I'd like to thank you viewers for watching and calling in. Have a good evening and happy gardening. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications.